special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast, working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics' mission at horizontherapeutics.com. This was put to me by my sister Uh, when we first moved to New York. She was there for a conference, and she said to me something very simple. She said, sit down, kid brother. The problem is not with your son. The problem is with you. You're still dreaming he's going to be a ball player, he's going to play sports. You're still dreaming he's going to be a rabbi. He's not going to play sports, and he's not going to be a rabbi. But you've got to change the yardstick, meaning you have to measure his successes with his yardstick, not with yours, so that if he does whatever it might be on a seemingly small scale, for him that might be more than winning the gold medal in the 100 meters you know, at the, at the Olympics. That's our guest this week, Rabbi Kalman Samuels. Rabbi Samuels and his wife Malki have seven children, one of whom, Yossi, became deaf and blind after taking a faulty vaccine. We'll hear the remarkable story of how Yossi learned to communicate, to read, and how Kalman and Malki started Shalva, a center that helps thousands of disabled children weekly gain an ability to have a more quality life. We'll also hear about Kalman's book, available on Amazon. It's an amazing story and one you'll enjoy on this special Father's Network Dad to Dad podcast. Say hello now to host... David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs, presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. So let's listen to this fascinating conversation between Kalman Samuels and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Kalman Samuels of Jerusalem, Israel, the father of seven, an Orthodox rabbi, an author, and co-founder of Shalva, the Israel Association for Care and Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities. Kalman, thank you for doing a podcast interview for the Special Fathers Network. Thank you so much. It's my honor. You and your wife, Malki, have been married for 48 years and the proud parents of seven children, Nekama, 46, Yossi, 45, Yakanan, 44, Avi, 42, Simka, 41, Shlomo, 39, and the couple's blessing, Sarah, who is 23. At 11 months, Yossi was given a faulty DPT vaccination, and shortly thereafter, he was rendered blind, deaf, and acutely hyperactive. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? Tell me something about your family. I grew up in Vancouver, Canada. A and a non-religious family. It went to a very big high school. Coming out of high school, uh, I had actually a basketball scholarships to university and academic scholarships. Did a year of university at the University of British Columbia, philosophy, math, and I decided what I really wanted to be is a professor of Western civilization and set my goals, my undergraduate years accordingly. And after the first year, I was on my way to France to study. And my mother asked me to visit Israel for two weeks en route. I did that. And I don't, I'm not quite sure what happened in those two weeks, but I never made it to France. Not, <laughs> not at that point, nor did I make it back to university. It, you know, I just sort of got, I, I don't want to use the word stuck, but my life changed, you know, trying to figure out what it was about Israel that I couldn't figure out. So I went for six weeks, then I went to the end of the summer, and my father was very, very upset that I was taking time off university, and uh, then I decided, well, I'll take a year and figure this out, and now it's been uh, something like 
51 years and I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> well, that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing. Um, so uh, out of curiosity, what did your dad do for a living? My dad was a successful lawyer and he had expectations of his son to be the same. And uh, when you were growing up, did you have siblings? Yes. I have an older brother, five years older, Jeff, and a sister, three years older, Marilyn. Gotcha. And uh, are they still back in Vancouver or where are they? One of them followed my trek and wound up in Israel. And my sister became a very well-known psychologist in Canada since retired, and she lives in Calgary, Alberta. Gotcha. Thank you. So when you think about your relationship with your dad, how would you describe it? And were there any important takeaways that you learned from him? You know, it's as a father myself, I have always taken my father's lesson and tried to implement it. And it's not easy. He did it magnificently. He was very concerned about my path, becoming religious and very religious, studying to be a rabbi, you know, uh, sitting in a, in a series of studies that he couldn't really appreciate. And yet, uh, he always gave me full dignity. I was his son, even if, as he said once, the path in life that I cherished, you refused to go. And he meant it very sincerely. And at the same time, he was there with me while I was studying, when I got married, when I was raising my children in a different way than I was raised um, as a religious individual. And when raising my kids, and I haven't always succeeded, I sincerely believe the most important thing is, is to let my child know that he or she is loved has nothing to do with the direction in life that they will take. And I think that's a very, very takeoff on my father who had his views, but was always there for his son. Yeah, well, well stated. Um, I think we each have dreams for our sons and daughters, our expectations maybe. And uh, it might be as simple as what university they attend, right? Um, and they want to go off in their own direction. And I think we have to discipline ourselves to support them and what their vision is, what their future is, as opposed to our, our dreams or our vision for them. So thanks for sharing. So I'm wondering what, if any, relationship your grandfathers played. My grandfathers were both immigrants to Canada at the turn of the century. I'm talking about 1906, 1907. <laughs> and um, they, one was from Russia, one was from Poland. And they were amazing people. They made lives for themselves in Canada, successful, you know, were in business, raised beautiful families. And I was very close to both of them. And the closeness was without condition again, that I just knew that my grandparents loved me. And it was sort of a no challenge in any way to be with them. And I think that was a critical thing that I felt always as a little boy that I had a lot of love from my grandparents. Yeah, well, um, it's a blessing if you have a chance to know your grandparents at all, right? You're so right. My dear wife, Malki, never had grandparents. Her mother was a Holocaust survivor. And, you know, most of the people who are children of Holocaust survivors never knew their grandparents. Yeah, well, I know that from uh, my first-hand experience. Three of my grandparents lived into their 90s, so I knew them not just as a young person, but as a young adult. Uh, they were in their 90s, and I was in my late 30s when they each passed away. So uh, they actually got to see and get to know their great-grandchildren, which was, I guess, a double blessing. So from an education standpoint, you mentioned that uh, you went to high school in Vancouver, you did a year of university at British Columbia, University of British Columbia, and then uh, you went to Israel and, uh, you know, you took a different path, uh, which was to pursue this rabbinical studies. And I'm wondering, looking back on it, what was it that drew you in to rabbinical studies and the path that you've chosen? Well, the first conversation I had towards the end of my two-week stay 
was somebody introduced me to a Orthodox rabbi, and he said to me something that a professor of mine in university had said to all of us. The professor in university was a brilliant philosopher, and he mocked in 1970, he mocked all the youngsters going to India at that time, saying that they are living in a vacuum, they don't know their own culture, and therefore they don't have a yardstick with which to assess another culture, especially an enormous culture like that of India. And he therefore said, if you want to be able to understand other cultures in the world, first focus your undergraduate years on your culture, Western civilization. And that was my goal. I bought into that because there was a lot of weird guys in those days running off to India. And when I met this rabbi in Israel towards the end of my two-week stay, he asked me, what am I doing? Where am I going? And I said, well, I'm leaving for France in two days. He asked me what I'm studying, and I explained to him Western civilization. And he said to me, why are you running to study someone else's civilization when you don't even know the roots of your own? So I said, what do you mean? Of course I know. I studied. I went to Sunday school. You know, I, I know. So he asked me a number of questions very politely, and I had no clue what he was talking about. He says, you need to study your own culture. And it hit me very strong because I realized within the greater Western civilization, I'm Jewish, there's, you know, enormous amount of roots and sources to study. And I agreed to take six weeks and there was like a great summer program with guys from MIT and Harvard. And he sold me a whole bill of goods in terms of what kind of brilliant guys are going to be there. And they were. They were older than me. But after six weeks, I realized that, hey, this is not a six-week study. Maybe I'll do it till the end of the summer and then move on. By the end of the summer, I realized, hey, this is not a summer program. This is something more serious. Let me take a year. So I'll take a year off. I'll still have my scholarships in another year. My dad will be okay. And uh, then I'll pursue my other goals. By the end of that year, I had already become religious. I realized that if I want to be an academic, I really would like to do it in the world of Jewish studies, of texts. And uh, that led me to my rabbinical studies. So it was actually a professor at UBC that was the focus as to why I moved on. Yeah, what's well, a lovely story. Thank you for sharing. And the image that I have in my mind is that this uh, professor, the Orthodox rabbi, set the hook, right? And didn't pull really hard, but just kept reeling. I guess I was the kind of fish that took it very easily. <laughs> I just bought into the bait. Well, uh, it's, it's a remarkable journey that you've been on. So thanks for sharing. I'm sort of curious to know, uh, how did you and Malki meet? Oh, Malki and I met in uh, the traditional way of, of Orthodox Jews that scares the hell out of non-Orthodox parents. <laughs> and that is an introduction. In, in Hebrew, it's called a shiduch, a match. You know, and there's so many stories of fiddler, matchmaker, matchmaker. But in this case, someone introduced us, and uh, that was the beginning. Okay. So it was a little bit more of a formal process. That's what I hear you saying. Yes, we didn't meet in a bar. Okay. So let's talk about uh, special needs first on a personal level and then beyond. And I'm sort of curious now, before Yossi's situation, did you or Malki have any exposure to the world of special needs? Malki did. Malki uh, was very close as a child. She used to go to uh, centers and, and volunteer with kids with special needs. Uh, as she got older, even though she wasn't trained yet, she had a part-time job working with a young lady with special needs. And my experience was less so. But as a young child, I grew up on the street with a girl who was probably five or six years older than I was. And from the time I was a little child, I remember my mother telling me never, ever to look at her other than to help her. And I learned early on from my mom, you know, how to work with these people. And I always helped Marilee with what she needed. And I loved doing it. And it made me feel good. In high school, I had a dear friend in my class who was deaf. And he was a bright guy. But I also learned that being deaf has nothing to do with 
sort of your lack of ability to do things. Yeah, well, the seeds were planted, if you will. Thanks for sharing. So what's the backstory? Um, what led to Yossi's situation? Yossi uh, was injured as an 11-month-old child when Malki took him for a routine vaccination. Unbeknown to the public at that time, the Ministry of Health here in Israel was having a severe problem with batches of vaccine, DPT. And tragically, for almost six months, they didn't put a stop to that vaccine. And we will never know how many children were injured, but I would sincerely believe hundreds. Uh, some of them lost their lives. Yossi became blind and later deaf and very hyperactive. And our young lives got flipped on their heads. So was it immediate or was there a delay uh, once the vaccine was delivered? No, Malki was at the center at 2 p.m. When I came home at 7.15 after my day of studies, there was no phones in those days, we're talking 1977, Malki was completely hysterical that there's something very wrong. His eyes are shimmering. He's not responding. He was already 11 months. He was, you know, a little bit of a child. And I saw the same things. But I said to her, well, let's not get hysterical. You know, maybe he's just got a bad cold. And she insisted, no, this is something very wrong. We called in our pediatrician. She came that night. And she too thought that maybe it's a virus, a cold, etc. It took another number of days and another visit for her to realize that this was something more. Because although we didn't know what a convulsion was, we described movements that she did understand. She sent us immediately the next day to a neurologist and the neurologist saw Yossi with her assistant for five or six minutes, discussed things with us and then in horror said to us, did this child recently have a DPT vaccine? Malki said, yes, doctor, that's when it began. There was nothing out there that we could ever have understood about this. There was no internet. Doctors were the next best thing to God in meaning that you just had a, a very, very deep trust. And I don't say one shouldn't have that trust, but in those days it was more or less absolute. And from that moment on, she didn't speak to us. She says one minute, she goes out of the room, and 15 minutes later she sent us down the hall to an optometrist. He took very serious checks with his machinery and uh, looked at Yossi for quite some time. And then instead of telling us what he saw, he wrote a long note back to her and said, please give this back to her. And so it continued. From that moment, we could not get any medical information. Clearly, you know, the government had brought down that no one's going to talk and no one talked. So we struggled for a year to understand what is going on. And things got much worse with his convulsions. And uh, my uncle was the head of orthopedics at Maimonides Hospital in Brooklyn. And he said, come out to the States for a short while. I'll put you in contact with some significant doctors who will talk to you and share whatever it is. And we did that. And the first doctor we saw was a neuro-ophthalmologist. And he did the same little contraption that the doctor in Israel looked at the eyes with. He looked. The difference is when he put his machine on the side, he said that, I'm sorry to share but your son's optic nerve is atrophied, which means pale, and he will never see again. That was like finality. You know, till then we had great hopes, and he dashed those hopes. The hearing set in a bit later. We didn't know about it for quite some time. And uh, ultimately, by the age of, I would say, two and a half, three, he was deaf. Wow. That must be like a ton of bricks. And if um, I've got a clear picture, um, you have an older child. Um, you've got Yossi. You moved to New York for an open-ended period of time. And then you you know, have these tests done and you get the load of bricks dumped on you. And I'm wondering, at that point, what were the fears that you and Malki had? Uh, what, what did life look like from that perspective? Life was extraordinarily challenging. Uh, Yossi was growing two, two and a half, three. 
He was into everything. You had to watch him that he shouldn't help hurt himself because he just was inquisitive. Uh, you had to watch him that he shouldn't in some way hurt his older sister or his younger brother who was born. And um, Malky had a full-time job 24-7. We realized that we're going to stay in the States for a while. We're not running back to Israel at that moment. And we enrolled him in what was considered the best school for the blind in the country at the time in Midtown Manhattan called The Lighthouse. And uh, I entered the computer field and uh, life continued. And uh, our fears were quite simple that we'll never be able to talk to our son again. He had lost communication, couldn't see, couldn't talk. There was no way other than giving him a hug or kissing him that you could express anything to him. Wow. So you mentioned that um, you had another son after Yossi, and were they were the uh, subsequent children born in New York, or what was the series of events? There were the first three. Yochanan was born slightly before we left. Three were born in Israel in succession, and we moved to the States. Three more were born in a little bit less, four and a half years in the States. So that was the family, one girl, five boys, very rambunctious boys. And uh, <laughs> as you mentioned in the opening, uh, 16 and a half years later, we were blessed with a beautiful little girl who is now 23. So you have bookends. The girls are the oldest and the youngest with the five boys in the middle. Correct. Okay. Well, um, that's, that's a lot of responsibility coming from a father of five who, you know, has a sense for what that means. Um, what comes to mind, I don't know if this is something that you and Malky have uh, discussed or reflected on, but when there's the two of you and one child, it's two on one. When there's two of them and two of you, it's man to man. And then when you get to three of them and only two of you, uh, you're in his own defense. And <laughs> when there's five like we had or seven like you have, you know, you get used to playing zone defense, right? Because you don't have any choices, right? Um, you need to come up with an effective way to sort of manage that situation. And I can only imagine what it would be like when one of the seven, um, in your case with Yossi, number two, having some of the... Uh, uh, challenges that he's had. Let's put it this way. I always describe it as having six and one who's worth 10. <laughs> That's fabulous. So not to focus on the negative, but just to be authentic, what would you say have been the biggest challenges as it relates to parenting? I would say the greatest challenge is coming to terms, uh, taking the bull by the horns and understanding that this is the problems my child is facing. And I was, this was put to me by my sister. Uh, when we first moved to New York, she was there for a conference. And she said to me something very simple. She said, sit down, kid brother. The problem is not with your son. The problem is with you. You're still dreaming he's going to be a ball player. He's going to play sports. You're still dreaming he's going to be a rabbi. He's not going to play sports and he's not going to be a rabbi. But you've got to change the yardstick, meaning you have to measure his successes with his yardstick, not with yours, so that if he does whatever it might be on a seemingly small scale, for him that might be more than winning the gold medal in the 100 meters you know, at the, at the Olympics. So it hit me like a ton of bricks and I burst out crying and I said, you're so right. But between saying you're so right and internalizing that and learning to appreciate not only your child with disabilities, each and every one of our children, to appreciate and measure them with their, whatever their yardstick might be, to use that yardstick. And I think that's probably the greatest challenge in learning how to do that and actually doing that. Yeah, it's one thing to understand it intellectually. But it's another thing to internalize it um, and actually fully accept that from your heart. That's what I hear you say. Absolutely. Was there a turning point uh, beyond what you've just described that helped put 
the OC's challenges, the larger challenge of raising a, a growing family like that into perspective? Well, there was a major change in our lives when uh, we were back in Israel at the age of eight. And Yossi was uh, attending a deaf school. And one extraordinary teacher of the deaf, who was deaf herself, put one of his palms on the table. And in the other palm, she spelled with symbols, Hebrew symbols, five letters. And she did this for days on end. And at some point, Yossi lit up. And she had the smarts to recognize that this was the moment that he got a breakthrough to communication and what we would call the Helen Keller moment. And we as parents had no clue what she was talking about. How could we possibly understand that this child who we couldn't speak to for seven years or contact in any way now so, somehow had a window on the world. But she was right. And she taught him the rest of the Hebrew uh, alphabet and he began signing letters she taught him words and on the basis of her work a extraordinary speech therapist decided she was going to teach him how to speak Hebrew and we actually didn't believe a word about how in the world is she going to penetrate over two years she did it and he learned how to speak Hebrew synthetically but you got to used to his accent and it, we all of a sudden had a son who could sign to us you could be signed back, and he could talk to us. So as a parent, I don't think there was ever a bigger moment for us between a situation where you're lost with no hope, and all of a sudden, it's back to life. Wow, that's amazing. Was the woman that you were referring to Shoshana Weinstock? She was, yes. I think of women like that or individuals like that as the angels that show up in our lives. No question about it. She showed up. She's a dynamo. And not only that, when that was over, she sat down. She said she's going to teach him how to write Braille on a six-key Braille machine. And his motor skills were a bit difficult. And in the school, they said she'd like, don't even start. And uh, over the summer, no one knew in the school. It was two months off. And uh, she taught him how to write Braille. And he was just off to the races. So she never stopped. She, she really was an educator of the finest order. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Very inspiring. So I'm sort of curious to know what impact Yossi's situation has had on his siblings, your marriage, and then the extended family. Well, I think to Malki's credit, on our marriage, it has only enhanced it. And I think that, to be quite honest, you know, the mother has the most impact there, that if she is fully behind it and accepted and loving and never thinking twice, it has impact on all the children. I think if parents are in any way hesitant about accepting their child with disabilities, it's picked up immediately by the other siblings and they will also be hesitant. They may well be embarrassed in public because mommy and daddy are a little bit embarrassed. And I think such children will not grow up to be the emotionally stable kids we want them to be. On the other hand, when mommy and daddy don't care what others think, people may look, people may stare. It's a very new thing to a lot of people. And knowing that this is our child, this is what God gave us, and we're going to do everything we have to do to develop he or she to the best of their abilities, this also is transferred to the other children. And in our case, there was like never a doubt. And our kids grew up as very proud brothers of Yossi. That was when they were small and today when they're adults. And I think that is the key to raising siblings of a child with a disability. Yeah, well, from your lips to God's ears, right? I think it's sort of like the top-down approach or um, leader by example is what I hear you saying. Right. If the parents get it right from the get go, everything sort of flows, you know, out of that. And again, easier to say than do, but it's a mindset. And I think that um, those parents, you know, you're very fortunate to have come to that realization. And you admitted it wasn't right away. Right. Your sister Marilyn banged you over the head, said, wake up, Colman. She actually said, wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> 
And you know, again, once you heard those words, it wasn't like immediate. No, many, many years of many, many years of a process. And I would be not telling the truth if I were to say that, okay, yeah, great. I got the message and everything was hunky dory. I love my child, but that had nothing to do with the fact that understanding that there's nothing I can do. And this is not my choice. I wasn't consulted. And he turned out, as most kids of this nature turn out to be, just a gift to the family. When the family set to receive that child, there's so much that people used to say, why are your children so different? And on a positive note. <laughs> and I said, because they've seen more in life as children, and they've seen what the real values of life are, but they're not fooled by all the fleeting things. They, they know what it's all about. Yeah, that's brilliant. So I'm thinking of supporting organizations. You already made reference to one back in New York City, the Lighthouse for the Blind. And I'm wondering if there's any other organizations before we talk about Shalva that your family's benefited from or Yossi has benefited from specifically. Well, in New York, Yossi outgrew the blind school. He went two years to something called, um, my goodness, I've forgotten the name, name of the neighborhood, but a wonderful school for the deaf. And they were very, very helpful. So we were there almost five years. We came back and we had the support of the school for the deaf. Later, at the age of 13, he transferred to the school for the blind. And all of these places did everything they could to empower Yossi in whatever way they could. And uh, it was quite extraordinary. Yeah, well, thank God for these uh, programs or organizations that serve those that are deaf or blind or have other disabilities for that matter. I'm wondering what role spirituality has played in your lives. I think it's played a very important role. I think from the get-go, Malki, you know, and I, as religious people, understood that this is a child that is ours. God did not make a mistake in an address. It wasn't intended for the next door neighbor. And that is something that we accepted. How to cope with the fact that God gave us the child is something that's, again, a process. And, and I think this spirituality had an enormous amount to do with the fact that we understood that Yossi is a soul that came down to this earth at a given moment in time to a given family, and that he has his journey whatever that journey might be, just as each of us has his journey. And our goal is to facilitate his role and his journey to the best of our ability. Yeah, well, if only that was more well broadly known or understood, the world would be a completely different place. So let's talk about Shalva, the Israel Association for the Care and Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities which is dedicated to providing transformative care for individuals with disabilities, empowering their families, and promoting social inclusion. From my understanding, what we know today of Shalva and how it began back in 1990, or maybe beyond 1990, um, are totally different. So what, what were the humble beginnings? What were the seeds that were planted that led to the creation of Shalva? Uh, we had a visitor, better said, Malki had a visitor while we lived in New York. And this was a mature woman from Jerusalem who uh, was there for personal reasons in Brooklyn, but she came to see poor Malki with her difficult situation. And in the course of that conversation, I was not there, I was at work. She said to Malki, you know, Malki, it's not fair for you to keep this child at home when your husband is impacted, all your children are impacted. And she suggested that she find an out-of-home out uh, setting for Yossi. And Malki cried that night and said, God, I'm never taking Yossi out of the home. You gave him to me. But if you ever decide to help my Yossi, I'm going to dedicate my life to helping other mothers with their challenges with children of disabilities. Years passed, and back in Israel, when Yossi had his breakthrough to 
communication, to speech. It, Malki sat me down and said, it's payback time. I made a promise. God heard my prayer. I know exactly what I want to do, and I need your help. From that moment, it took a number of years because with all her dreams and knowing what she, how she wanted to help other people, I realized that without money, we just can't rent a facility or do anything. So it took some time. A friend of my father's ultimately said, you know what, let me help your wife with her dream. And we rented a, an apartment. We, I knew nothing about nonprofits, nothing about how they operate. I was in the computer field and I had to learn. And we established Shalva, which is actually a word in the mentioned once in the ent entire Bible uh, in Psalms 122 verse 7 where it says that um, may there be peace in your walls shalva or serenity in your edifice so shalva means peace of mind or serenity and that was our goal to try and provide families with that ability to have a more quality life so in 1990 we rented a apartment, a garden apartment. We started with five kids, all with severe disabilities. Malki ran an after-school program with one professional. I was at work. And the goal was to connect the school programs that the government paid for in the morning with the after-school that we gave, where the children were bused home at 6 p.m. after a hot meal. And that meant that we had critically changed the lives of those families, because now mommy and daddy could work a full day, siblings could go to school and come home and do homework, and when that child disability came home at 6.15 or 6.30, the family was ready and built to accept him with love. But it's a fundamental change in how they live. Yossi was in the blind school every day till 6 p.m., so while Yossi was the impetus of creating the program, it was not for Yossi. He never had to participate there. It was for other kids as payback. That's still some very humble beginnings, um, starting with just a handful of families. And I'm wondering, how did it proceed? Was there a lot of demand from other families that, you know, pushed you, propelled you to do something on a grander scale than just this small garden apartment that you started in? I like to say that if a person needs a proof that God has a very interesting sense of humor, all he has to see is our development 31 years from five kids to a thousand a day right now. And what happened was people banged on my door. They phoned me. I have a son. I have a nephew. The family needs to be saved. You must take him into this program. And Malki, in the meantime, expanded programs from after school to overnight once a week, every day of the week for families to, uh, you know, programs for new mothers in the morning, uh, daycare programs, preschools. All these things were developed over the, over the years and the numbers kept growing. So we went one, from one apartment to a second apartment next door, two of them, to building our own center in 98, which was, we thought, enormous, 18,000 square feet on seven floors. And then the government of Israel came to me in 2005 and said, look, we need to get not one, but 100 kids into your programs. You don't have physical space. If we give you a large piece of land, would you build? And I said, no. And <laughs> they then brought me down to see the land and it was so outrageous. It was seven acres in the heart of the city. And Malki saw it as well. And we realized, although we had no idea how we could do this, it was an opportunity that would never be repeated. This is, you know, who gives seven acres to a nonprofit in the middle of the city? It was very challenging land, large, almost like a mountain of dirt on it. And, but we said, you know what? Let's go for it. It's not a crime to fail, but it would be a crime not to at least try. And as I say, from nothing, we wound up raising over the next 10 years $70 million and building a 220,000 square foot center on 12 floors with some of the most beautiful facilities one can imagine. Yeah, well, I know in reading about the story, the construction, the planning of it, it wasn't a straight line. <laughs> Not at all. Things always take more time and cost more money, and there's always people who are going to be in opposition to what you do. And that wasn't lost on me, as you recalled the story um, in your book, 
um, about some of the challenges that had ensued. And if you were just to provide a brief overview, you know, what people's appetite uh, for what transpired, you have the opportunity to receive the seven acres. It's like a blessing and a curse, right? There um, is not enough money, right, to do what, you know, could or should be done. Um, so what were the steps? How, how did that story transpire? It started off with much smaller plans, and uh, we thought the budget would be $18 million to build 60,000 square feet. We didn't know that the mountain that was on our land was actually compacted rubble from the neighborhood above us, which some 60 years ago they dumped into the ravine. So there was no place to put down foundations or anything else. Worse, there was a old hotel, an old four-star hotel, but very large, right on the road above us. And we were shocked that they fought the gift of land from the city and their reasons are still beyond me. Um, everyone said NIMBY, I don't know what it was, but they fought us, very powerful people, and they dragged us through 15 different courts, fighting that we should never be able to get our building permit. And they succeeded for five years in delaying it, and it got to the point where I was not sure I would ever be able to complete this building. But by hook or by crook, with God's help, we got past that, and uh, we were able to build the building. But it was something that I think took my own personal health at risk. It was extremely, extremely challenging. Yeah, plus you had to raise some money along the way, didn't you? Oh, absolutely, because what we discovered is that if we want to build the building, we got to take away the mountain and build from the bottom up. And if we ever want to get to the top, we got to build many stories. So it turned out to be, as I say, an enormous 12-story building that is absolutely stunning and that's part of our goals yeah have you ever heard the word or phrase bhag no bhag b h a g is an acronym for big hairy audacious goal <laughs> and maybe you didn't know it at the time i heard other words like megalomania <laughs> like a like a white elephant that's never going to be needed yeah what can i tell you within a year or two after building the building and completing it in 2016 we didn't have a place to put a needle. Yeah. Well, one of the other things that I remember was Malki's attention to detail and her vision, which was to make this the most um, enlightened and open space with the uh, certain types of finishes, right? Certain types of colors. And I remember there was a story, if I remember it, where there was a certain type of tile and the tile didn't exist. What was that about? Malki, with the, the builders were moving forward very quickly and Malki wanted a warm, soft, rustic, reddish tile in the whole building. She didn't want blue, didn't want green, didn't want black, something soft and in, inviting. And with all her pursuits and major you know, tile places here in Israel, she couldn't find anything close. And someone came along at a very interesting moment. She, there was tremendous pressure for her to make a decision because she was going to start delaying the whole process. And a guy came out of nowhere and says, don't buy, I can get you what you need in Italy. So everyone mocked it. If you don't have it here, they don't have it in Italy. Bottom line is, two weeks later, Malki flew to Bologna in Italy, a difficult ride through Rome, and uh, went to factories that were larger than football fields of tiles. This was like the center. And it turned out very quickly that they had everything in the world, but they didn't have a rustic red. And this was a, two days of searching the next factory, the next factory. And finally, the Italian guide is, was speaking to one of the owners of these factories. And he said to him in Italian, he says, the lady is very dedicated tell her to come with me. And she went and he introduced her to his designer. And he told his designer in Italian, make this lady exactly what she wants. He also said, he's never done this before for a private customer. But that was it. So Malki sat and designed the tile she wanted with the head designer there, and which quite a process. But a few weeks later, you know, she had her tile. So she didn't give up. And actually 
didn't have many opportunities to get it, but it wound up happening. Yeah, well, it's another uh, testimony to Malki's vision, her tenacity, the persistence that goes into all that. And, uh, you know, just such a heartwarming story. I have to meet this woman. Let's talk about your book, Dreams Never Dreamed, A Mother's Promise That Transformed Her Son's Breakthrough into a Beacon of Hope. came out uh, in English after it was done in Hebrew in May of 2020. This did not take overnight to write. My recollection was that you were journaling over a long period of time. And I'm wondering, what was the impetus so many years later, you know, later in life, if you will, to actually put the story in writing? You're absolutely right. This was written down as a journal. You know, I did, couldn't bother Malky late at night with my concerns and, and worries. And I learned it's great therapy to just write a journal. And I used to write my feelings down in real time. Over the years, I also realized that I wanted very much to share the story. Yossi begged me all the time. He wanted people to know he wasn't born this way. He was injured. And it was very important to him that I tell his story. And it was important to me to put out the background to Shalva, because otherwise people view it maybe as a government facility or what have you. And I ultimately did it. My father, before he died, made the request that, for God's sakes, write the book. And it took many, many more years. But ultimately, somehow it got done. Yeah, well, I loved reading it. I could not put the story down. I made a couple of notes in preparation for our conversation. And I'm wondering if you could uh, react to the uh, passages that I'm going to share. This has to do with the importance of staying together, giving up on your own goals and dreams, realize life has changed forever, and making new choices. Is that what you were referring to earlier when you were talking about the yardstick? I believe so. That's all part of the process. And, you know, it's just, if you don't do that, you're lost. Because your life will continue with the challenges, whether you like it or not. And the only question will be if you're going to function or not. So some people run away from the problem. That's one solution. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's the responsible one. And... It is a matter of realizing that your own dreams, not only for the child, I had other dreams. I had dreams of being in whatever it would be, an academic and in the rabbinical fields. And, you know, I realized at some point that, hey, that's not happening. And so you, you shift. Then I had an opportunity to go into the computer field and I went into it. Uh, but you make your choices based. I was offered a wonderful, wonderful position, a rabbinical position outside of New York that was, I was shocked how much these people would pay to have a rabbi. And I said to the person who told me, I said, it's a wonderful opportunity, but it's not for me. My son needs help here in New York, and I need a portable way of making a living that if I ever move back to Israel, I'll be able to transport it there. It's not to become a traveling salesman as a rabbi for one community and maybe another. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. Uh, There was a story in the book about a rabbetzin, an older woman known in Orthodox Jerusalem who came to visit. And um, there was this uh, back and forth between Malki and this woman. Do you know what I'm referring to? Absolutely. It's the front end to the story I told. She was the woman. A rebbe's in in, uh, in Hebrew in, in means a a woman who was like a rabbinical figure. She's the wife of a very important rabbi. She's very studious and very learned. This woman was probably 50 when Malki was maybe 24, 25 at the time. And Malki knew her as a teacher, as a youngster in Israel, and had great respect for her. And she was the woman that made the visit and told Malki she should think about getting the kid out of the house. And Malki, <laughs> being Malki, said to her, you know, you know how much respect I have from you, for you, but you do have a, a small problem. 
She says, looked at her like, what's that? She says, you don't believe in God. <laughs> now, for this woman to hear that is like telling Bill Gates that he's broke. <laughs> you know, it's like, what else does she have if not her faith? That's what she was. And she says, how can you say such a thing to me? You know, who exactly gave me this child? If you are a believer in God, where did he come from? You know, what should I cut off? Which arm, which hand? He's part of me. And the woman felt very badly and uh, basically you got the message. They left on good terms. But it was that night that Malki had her thought of, hey, you know, if you ever decide to help my Yossi, I'm going to do a lot for others. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. There was another uh, character in the book. Um, I think his name was Donnie Epstein, and I believe he was a chiropractor. That's right. And a word that's often associated with uh, chiropractic is quackery. I don't know if that was your characterization or whose, but I'm wondering if you can relate the story. My uncle was the head of orthopedic surgery at Maimonides. I grew up that, that a chiropractor was exactly as you said, a quack. You cannot make changes to the body externally. You have to, if you got a problem, you got to go operate. So, you know, I was raised that way, not that it was spoken about a lot, but clearly, you know, I knew that much. And someone suggested to us while we're in New York that Yossi's gait was very awkward as a young child. He had a little few problems walking and his nose was stuffed closed from all his falls. And uh, someone suggested to my wife that you should try a chiropractor. And this guy, Danny Epstein in Brooklyn, not that far from our house, he's amazing. You got to go to him. So the next thing I know, Malky tells me that on Thursday afternoon, we're going to see this guy. And I said specifically, you, go, you got to be nuts. I'm not going to a quack. You go yourself. She says, no, you're coming with me. So we went and it was a fascinating guy. Turned out to be a superstar in the field. And it's the very first meeting. He did nothing invasive. He just touched Yossi. And Yossi, what we were shocked about, that Yossi loved every minute with him, sitting him on his lap, touching the back of his cranium, whatever it was. And he explained to us all the different things, showing us, you know, the back, et cetera, et cetera. And we went and we went to him once a week for some time. And after about six weeks, Malki yelled to me in the house, and she says, Kalman, come quick. She says, what do you see? And Yossi's nose had completely cleared, and he was suddenly able to breathe through his nose. Now, there was nothing else we could attach that to other than the fact that Donnie used to work a lot on that part of his face. And uh, that was one thing. And the other thing was that Yossi became much more sedate, much quieter. And uh, between that and a healthy diet, the teacher at the blind school refused to believe that Yossi could have become more docile as a result of those things. But today, you know, I have utmost respect for the profession. And uh, my aunt once said to me when I asked her, I said, Auntie Edie, doesn't Uncle Herschel see the changes in Yossi? How can he explain them if not this chiropractor? She says, Calm and I see them, but don't ever expect your uncle, the orthopedic surgeon, to admit to it. <laughs> well, there's a reason that um, I love the story that you're just telling. And uh, you're going to have to fact check me on this. But uh, there's a lawyer here in the Chicago area. He's 86 years old. His name is George McAndrews. He's a neighbor, a friend, and a Bible study uh, member as well. And uh, he is, by uh, profession, an uh, intellectual property attorney. So he's an engineer, and he practiced intellectual property for 40 years with a firm called McAndrews, Held, and Malloy. So he was one of the you know, three principal founders of this firm, which dates back 30 or 40 years. And as a pro bono case representing chiropractors, he sued the American Medical Association because of the way that they limited the chiropractors, right? And they actually had created within the American Medical Association, remember, you have to fact check me, the Committee on Quackery. That's what the American Medical Association did. And they discredited the entire field of chiropractic. 
And it took him over a decade of legal proceedings. And the way he tells the story, it's a David and Goliath story. He's David, one attorney against this bank of attorneys from the most prestigious law firms in the country here in the US um, battling. They're representing the American Medical Association and he's representing the Chiropractic Association, right? Which is just, you know, couldn't be any different. And they won, right? David beats Goliath, right? It, it transformed the field of chiropractic. Completely. Yeah. Sadly though, there's this perception years, decades, generations later, right? That chiropractic is still sort of quackery, right? There's that association that still exists in people's minds. I think, I think it's also a problem of overreach. In other words, I think chiropractics has its place, legitimate place, and is an amazing, amazing tool. But I think even there sometimes the claims are made that it's the be-all to, to solve all. And just like areas of medicine are areas of medicine, they can't solve all the problems. I think we also have to respect the fact that even on chiropractics, there's a limitation. Right. But I think that's also part of the problem. Yep, I would agree. And it's um, not a one-size-fits-all solution, but there are legitimate aspects of chiropractic that some people benefit from and others don't, right? No, for sure. Listen, I'm number one benefactor. You know, I've, I'm the first one to say amazing things, and I'm well aware of the battles you're talking about. And it was indeed David against Goliath. And by the way, it's changed in Israel as well. There are chiropractors practicing and working in hospitals, which was something that was 25, 30 years ago would have been absolutely impossible. Yeah. So uh, let's just talk about one more aspect of the book. Um, we could talk for hours and hours. It's just such a fascinating read. Um, but one of the chapters is called Parallel Lives, and it has to do with the lawsuit over the faulty DPT vaccine. While Yossi was experiencing all these breakthroughs, right? The breaking out of the silence and the darkness. And I'm wondering if you can just summarize briefly uh, what that legal battle um, experience was about. Way back in, uh, long before I established Shalva, um, I learned that there was something going on. Uh, we visited doctors in New York and one of them asked the neurologist that we initially saw to send a report. He knew her. And the report she sent came to my hands, of course, and it was full of lies. She had altered all kinds of milestones as a child that we had the original records of, uh, and she had altered them, they, that he, he, he sat up at a later stage and all kinds of things that would indicate that his problems were there from birth. And I hit the roof and I said, this is not going to happen. And I began to investigate and it just got worse and worse from there, and I was a busy guy. I had, I had little young children. I had a very big position in the computer world. I didn't have a lot of time. There was no computers yet. There was no PCs, I mean to say. That came out some years later. And I just said, hey, this is not going to fly. And I began to investigate. It got to the point where I had a lot of information. And I met a young lawyer in Israel. I met him in New York. And his name was Avi Fisher, and he was a brilliant gold medal winner a year before and he said he's going to see what it's all about and get to the bottom of this and he began doing his work and uh, this was 1981 and in 1983 we brought a case against the government of israel the public health centers that gave it and my goals were twofold on the one hand my son was not dead my son needed a great deal of help in his life and I wanted to see if I could secure some of that from those who injured him. And the other thing I wanted was to expose this scandal. So it went on for nine years, and that was part of the scandal, that it just never ended. It took my and my wife's Malki everything out of us. And when we talk about parallel lives, it, it means on the one hand, caring for Yossi, which was overwhelming. And on the other hand, managing a legal case because... The law firms didn't have huge, you know, staff invested in this. I did a lot of the research. I did a lot of things with it. And um, it went on for nine years, sadly, until the 
the judge. There's no jury in Israel. It's the British system of law with a single judge. And he said that at the beginning of this, I thought it was little people trying to bother the big establishment. But at this point in time, I see it very differently. And he said to the lawyers for the state and for the, the medical center there uh, that he wanted to provide a settlement. And if they didn't want to provide a settlement, he would feel free then to, you know, give his decision. They understood that he was serious. And after a lot of haggling and everything else, we took a decision. It was a moral victory. It was not what I had wanted. But Malki put it best in focus. She says, I have no problem with you going on and, you know, fighting. And it'll go to the Supreme Court because they're not going to accept it. And it'll be another two or three years. And, you know, I have no problem with you doing that. But just give me my divorce first. <laughs> because she was finished. <laughs> So that was the end of it all. And the interesting thing was that the settlement came literally six weeks before we opened Shalva. So someone said to me, like, what are you going to do? You've been so busy with this legal case. I said, you know what? I got something new on the block, and I think I'll be pretty busy. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Um, uh, listeners will have to read the book to get some more details, but um, an amazing journey. One last thing before we wrap up. I learned about the Shalva band, and my recollection was there was this wounded IDF veteran that approached you, Shai Ben Shashan, with this idea. And I'm wondering if you can briefly relate. What is the Shalva band, and why are they the ambassadors? In the year 2005, we had, from almost from day one, music was a very integral part of our programs. You know, that whether it was volunteers playing guitar, but music was just as it is with so many such programs, such an important component. And I had a music therapist working with the kids. This young man came by, and uh, I saw he limped a little bit. He was a little bit, didn't quite get it what it was. But he came into my little office, and he says that uh, he would like to establish a band. He'd like to work as a music therapist, and he'd establish a band. So I asked him to explain what he means. He says, you'll establish a band. You'll start picking out the kids, etc." So I saw there was something different. I said, Shai, tell me a little bit about yourself. So he explained that a year and a half earlier, he had, was in the Israeli army and he was injured by grenades thrown by terrorists. And he had to reconstruct his, his, much of his body had to be reconstructed, including his jaw, learn how to speak. And I said, hey, if this is the guy, I said, Shai, how long is it going to take you? He says, a year. I said, okay, let's go for a year. I wanted to give him an opportunity, and that's it. So he went for a year, and he picked out one kid and another kid who had musical ability, young kids with Down syndrome, with other syndromes, and it began to be somewhat of a little band. What we didn't dream of as this thing was going to grow into what has become the foremost band in the world for people with disabilities is called the Shalva Band, and it has two blind uh, young women solo soloists, has a drummer who has something called Williams syndrome that as a result of the band has got a lot of publicity. Two young people who started the first group with Down syndrome, they're still in the band, a guitarist and a uh, keyboard. And the band got into a competition. They were invited to get in, like America has talent, so Israel has talent. And they wiped out the competition and they went to the finals. The winner of this competition would represent Israel in what's called Eurovision. Eurovision is the largest musical event in the world, 42 European countries, and there's a viewing audience of over 200 million. So to be representing Israel would have been a huge thing. They had to withdraw from the competition as finalists because uh, they learned from the Eurovision people that over and above their performing on Saturday night, they would have to have a dry rehearsal, full rehearsal on Friday night. Four of them are religious kids. They could not do that on what is known as the Sabbath. And they decided amongst themselves that we came in as a family, we're going to leave as a family. And it was huge news in Israel that the Shalva band is leaving. Actually, huge news everywhere in the English world as well. And what happened is the Eurovision people then turned to us, to the promoters here, and said we would like 
the Shalva band to appear as just artistic content. So they did appear and they did play in front of 200 million people at Eurovision and they wowed the world. The BBC wrote that tweeted immediately, this is what it's all about. This is the most fantastic thing. Cause every night And since then, they've gone on and they've played for the president. They've played uh, on huge stages everywhere. And they're bringing with them the message of inclusion and the fact that a person with disabilities doesn't mean that he doesn't have abilities. He may have a limitation, but that does not define him. And in terms of that, they have become representatives of the World Health Organization for one of their initiatives to improve world health for people with disabilities. There's two of the singers are their, were their spokesmen, and we are consultants today to the United Nations. So it, things have happened beyond anything we could have imagined. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. I remember watching a YouTube video. It was a performance at Google. Yes. It was New York Google office, and it was just before they were invited. Someone from the program saw that Google one-hour program and said, we have to invite this band to appear. Yeah, well, there were some renditions of Hotel California and Sounds of Silence that brought tears to my eyes, right? It was just such a powerful um, experience. So uh, from your lips to God's ears, I'm hoping they continue to um, enjoy the success that they've had and, uh, you know, continue to transform people's lives, right? Absolutely. By demonstrating that they have abilities, even though most of the world would suggest they have disabilities. Let me just share one anecdote. One of the young men is a, one of the first people, he's now 28, and he was a, a child when he started. And a, they had a huge outdoor performance a, with like 9,000 people. And they put up a, a, a wall of like a metal fence so that people shouldn't push onto the stage. And when this young man went off the stage, he had become very much a star and a, a face in Israel. Everybody knew. And the young people, 12, 13, 14, in this community uh, began screaming his name. We want a selfie. And he said later how things have changed, that today they want my selfie, and not that long ago, they wanted me out of their sight. And so the band is changing social consciousness among young people, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I love it. It's brilliant. Okay, well, I wish we had more time, but uh, we're going to have to wrap things up. I'm wondering uh, briefly, uh, beyond the advice you've already shared, if there's any advice you can provide a dad young parents, for that matter, who are raising a child with differences. If we're talking about dads, I do have a piece of advice. Very sensitive, but I think very powerful. As dads, we have to understand that we are functional in nature. Our wives gave birth to that child. It is a completely different emotional relationship for the mother as opposed to the father. And fathers, if they want to have a healthy family, must go the entire distance to support their wives and not a 50-50 relationship where it's a tit for a tat. No, it's 100% without any expectations of return. And if they do that, I'm quite confident they will have very happy lives because every typical wife will respond in kind. But at the outset... There shouldn't be this reticence of, oh, I'm give No, don't think so much. Just give and give and give, and you will have a happier life. Yeah, well, thank you for making it sound so simple and straightforward. Why is it that you've agreed to be a mentor father as part of the Special Fathers Network? Because you asked me, and I think it's very, very important, and I have great, great admiration 
for what you're doing. And I recognize the problems. And I, we have support systems here. And I'm once a year, I'm off asked to provide a my own input to fathers. And over the years, I've seen the such enormous importance to be able to share with fathers and help them because the challenges are challenges and nothing will change. But if our mindset is different and we understand more, then it's less of a surprise and we can hopefully cope. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you for being part of the group. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Thank you, and God bless you for all you're doing. Well, thank you. Uh, let's give a special shout out to our mutual friend, Elias Tromberg, founder of Fathers Connect there in Jerusalem, for making the introduction. Thank you so much. He's an extraordinary human being. Let's also give a special shout out to Doran Almug, retired Major General in the Israel Defense Force, founder of Allah Negev, and Special Fathers Network podcast ad number 100 for his commitment to serving those with disabilities there in southern Israel. Another amazing human being. If somebody wants to learn more about Shalva, your book, Dreams Never Dreamed, or contact you, what's the best way to do that? Simplest way is by email, dreams, never dreamed, one word, at gmail.com. We'll be sure to include that in the show notes, as well as links to the shalva.org website as well. Kalman, thank you for taking the time and many insights. As a reminder, Kalman is just one of the dads who is part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concerned. Would you please consider making a tax deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Kalman, thanks again. I cannot thank you enough. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I'm interviewed by a lot of people, and you're just the best. I can't thank you enough. You're too kind. Thanks again. God bless. And thank you for listening to the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children match up with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support other dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stCenturyDads.org. The Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast was produced by me, Tom Couch. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.